Yeah, so how are you feeling today? And where do you want to get sick, U.S. or Canada? In order to find out, we're going to talk to a Canadian, our favorite Canadian, Ken Rogers in Kelowna, British Columbia. Hi, Ken. Hello, Jay. You know, I'm looking at the um, Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, you know, there's some health provisions in there. But the Inflation Reduction Act had it passed by, um, by Kamala Harris to break the tie because Republicans voted against it, all of them. And so um, the politicization of health, health benefits of pharma hasn't really changed in this country. It's almost as if half the country doesn't want the other half to have medical care. Um, and as a result, our you know, outcomes aren't so good. Our health costs are you know, really astronomical. And uh, Americans are dying sooner than they have to. Um, is life better in Canada? It is lots better in that regard. Um, you know, in particular, our health care is, is universal in a sense that if you have any medically necessary procedure uh, that's covered, period. You know, so if you have a heart attack, you don't pay anything. Um, if you have, a, that is the individual. And ours is based on the need rather than on your ability to pay. So that, um, you know, something like a um, hip replacement uh, in Canada, because that's a medically necessary procedure, but it's not as, as urgent a need as a heart attack or certain cancer things or, you know, a traffic accident you know, you you would continue to get bumped down the line. And, and so you'd have a waiting list for something like a hip replacement. But when you have uh, universal coverage, by universal, I mean, absolutely everybody is covered. And the priority is on the need, uh, how medically necessary is that procedure. Um, you're you're going to have a, a lot healthier society, but you're also going to have an awful lot more medical procedures. That is, if, if you think of uh, in the U.S., uh, the, when does the poor person uh, going to get their knee replacement or hip replacement? You know, well, if they don't have insurance that covers it, they're just going to delay it or not get it. You know, and so the economy suffers because that person is less healthy. Um, I was uh, most surprised in Canada when they, um, uh, you know, I'm old enough that I uh, went through the many years that it took for the Canadian system to come into place. And by the way, the Canadian system is, is nowhere as um, all-inclusive as some of the European countries. You know, the Scandinavian countries, Germany, Holland, uh, uh, they all have, uh, Britain and France, they have a more um, inclusive universal system than Canada. Like our system does not include dentistry. Uh, now it does include, you know, if you were in a car accident or you got thugged on the street and you had your your chin bashed in, uh, you know, and you're in a hospital, that procedure to fix your your mouth and your teeth and everything is included in the medical and, and in the assess the universal coverage as a medically necessary procedure but uh, you know otherwise uh, you know dentistry is not included but the um, <clears throat> I grew up as as the um, uh, the laws changed and what was or was not included in the Canadian system. And ours is far from, from perfect, but it's sure better than the American in the sense that we do not have uh, people go bankrupt because of a needed procedure for themselves or for a loved one. You know, the thing that surprised me most as, as the um, uh, many years went by and the Canadian system got developed was the attitude of medical doctors. Uh, initially the doctors were the most opposed to the to the whole idea that they 
kind of had the idea that if you had some general national Medicare system, they were just going to be civil servants and going to have be stomped down and and whatever. But actually, it's been a fantastic bonanza for the doctors. It's it's been a uh, um, you know, economically, the best thing that ever happened to them. Uh, they have less expenses. They don't have to, you know, have any collection problems. Uh, and yet, you know, the doctors, like the doctor services are all covered as if they were medically necessary. So a hypochondriac can go into your corner a medical professional, you know, every every two weeks for forever and ever and each time he goes to visit it clicks through the meter and the doctor gets paid you know it's really up to the doctor to tell him to stop coming in for unnecessary things uh, because the the legislation treats it all as necessary um so you know they you know they have um uh, you know, some efforts by the provincial governments to try to um, prevent, you know, somebody that's churning customers through, you know, and not they're not really necessary visits, but those are pretty rare. But the, uh, you know, the doctors, uh, you know, they don't have the same expenses that a doctor in the U.S. has. Um, the... Uh, <clears throat> The first side is they don't have any bad debts. Anybody comes in, uh, there's a fee schedule. The fee schedule is really negotiated between the, uh, uh, let's call it the medical union. <laughs> I call it a union, even though in theory, it's a professional organization. Um, but uh, it's each province negotiates for the fees for each service that somebody provides. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so they get paid in full for, you know, somebody coming through for each each item. Um, the you know the litigation is something that in Canada there's almost none of uh, for um, malpractice. Um, that there's a, a federal um, entity that handles all of the. Um, malpractice claims and uh, and for example um i looked at a study the other day that had um uh, over the last five years about two hundred and fifteen thousand people estimated to have died because of um of medical uh ac me let's call it medical errors you know rather than i'll soft pedal the word malpractice, but enough of an error that somebody died and that in the United States would have instantly brought on mega litigation. Well, of those, uh, only 2% of them actually ended up in any litigation. Of those, um, a little over two thirds of those, that teeny percentage were kicked out by the courts, like just dismissed fairly quickly, or the um, applicant abandoned it. Well, in the end, you really only had um, two and a half percent of the um, claims that proceeded. You know, there was the small percentage that even got to a lawsuit, and then you had only two and a half percent of those that ended up in damages. And the average damages for over a whole five year period, including, you know, if there were any big numbers in comes in the average was a little over $100,000. Uh, so that you really had, uh, you know, uh, you know, five years for the whole country, you know, which has a population about the same as California. Um, you know, you only had about $2 million of, of um, money paid out. Now, they really don't have any uh, that I could see where there's punitive damage. You know, the, the um, 
and and part of it is really you get a correlation of interest between the government and the medical profession if the government has to tax to get the money to pay for the medical um they don't want to pay more because of a bunch of legal action and they're the ones that create the legislation so you really have you know a medical doctor for example will pay a fee for um it's a pretty small fee compared to american insurance cost uh, you know for his medical malpractice or whatever just so you keep it on the plate well you know in canada's biggest province ontario i think that ontario pays 85 percent of the fee even you know and it, it's like in essentially nothing um so that the um <clears throat> the cost of all of the medical in Canada is about two thirds of what it is per capita or as a percentage of GDP than compared to the US. And yet we got a bigger, a better bang total. I mean, your economy is better if you have the, you know, bottom you know, one third of the people getting much, much better health care or, you know, whoever the people are that portion of the people that can't afford care if it was on a pay to pay it to yourself basis. Well, you so, think outcomes are better um, if you're going to get sick? I mean, forgetting about the economics for a moment, where would you rather be sick? Well, uh, if I was uh, very wealthy, and I could afford to go to the Mayo Clinic, I would rather get sick in the United States. But if I were any ordinary citizen, I would sure prefer it in Canada. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, you know, the, um, the quality of the average, you know, physician is essentially the same. The, technology being used is the same uh it's just um in canada the priority is is need in the u.s the priority for who gets served first is is who puts the money on the table first mm. or the most money mm. what about drugs um uh, you know pharma is huge global industry and sometimes a the price bears virtually no relationship to the cost of manufacture or even the cost of R and D. Um, how would, has the cost of drugs, the availability of drugs, pharmaceuticals uh, in Canada? Well, it's um, let me split it down. If you um, go into a hospital and you have um, oh some. Uh, you know, medically necessary procedure, though that's the terminology. And you got some weird disease like Guillain Barre. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. Yeah. You know, but it's one that if it's not caught, the result is it, it starts to look like a polio. Um, anyhow, the um, medically medical method to solve that is is really um to take thousands of blood um, donations and you create a plasma that's a mixture of 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 a large number of blood donations and um and you have a cocktail of that and a bunch of um pharmaceuticals and that that cures it now, I have a very close relative that had that disease, which is why I at least have heard of it. Um, and um, and it was all in the hospital and 100 percent of it was paid for. It cost nothing, nothing whatsoever. Mm -hmm. You know, the drugs included mm -hmm. or my wife, uh, who died of cancer about five years ago, but went through a fair amount of um, chemotherapy and and chemo is essentially a whole bunch of drugs that was a hundred percent paid for by the canadian system you know she and i didn't have to pay anything for those drugs 
No, if I go to my normal G GP or general practitioner, and he suggests I should take uh, Tylenol threes for something, um, give, he may give me a prescription, and I go to the corner drugstore, and I have to pay the drugstore something for that. However, that drugstore has bought it under the Canadian um, pharma, uh, you know, pharmacare type of system, and so that. The drugstore didn't pay Pfizer or Merck or, or Abbott or any of the big pharma companies the full price for that 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 the U.S. pays. Uh, you know, they've negotiated a price and then uh, usually each provincial government even subsidizes those. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and so you you really don't have much uh, like drugs that like there are few things not included in the Canadian system. You know, I, I mentioned dentistry, uh, you know, eye care, you know, if you go and have your eyes tested to see whether you need new glasses or not, that is not covered in the Canadian system. And, and there's a few other items, but drugs is, is one of the items. Well, everybody can also get in Canada supplementary insurance and because the the costs of the of the drugs at the drugstore have been subsidized by the governments firstly by negotiating prices for everybody um you know buying in bulk uh that uh, then this insurance for somebody is very is a very nominal cost compared to u.s prices yeah it reminds me of the movie Sicko, uh, which was um, a, a kind of a, a story of, of 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 the firefighters and first the first line defense people who helped after 9-11. And, and one of the elements of the movie was uh, these people were taking very expensive drugs to deal with the medical issues that uh, arose out of their work at the at the site of 9-11. And and they wound up um, um, making fun of that by going into Cuba, uh, and these same the very same firemen were in Cuba, buying the very same drug that cost uh, a fortune in the United States, um, and it cost pennies, literally pennies, in Cuba. Same drug, same manufacturer, and you really wonder how that disparity could exist. And. And by the way, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act that uh, just passed in the Senate in awaits action in the House, um, I think. Um, this is hot news. You know, it passed only because Kamala Harris um, broke the tie. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry was kicking and screaming uh, about the provision that would allow negotiation of drug prices, like in Canada, like Canada has had for years. But in the United States, drugs are so much more expensive because there hasn't been any such, uh, you know, ability uh, for the government or any of the government agencies involved in health to negotiate the, the cost of the drugs. Um, and now there's going to be uh, some negotiation possible, but there, there are caps. There are various caps, and it's an imperfect solution, and it's not nearly as good as what you describe in, in Canada. And I, I find it remarkable, even now, when we recognize that People are dying for the lack of insulin, for example. Still, the pharmaceutical industry fights like hell um, to stop um, any kind of relief for them. And uh, these caps are, are really a thorn in the side of anyone uh, who cannot afford to buy the drug, doesn't have insurance and the like. Well, um, you mentioned Cuba. Yeah. And, uh, and I, you know, as a Canadian, uh, we, you know, don't consider Cuba to be so bad compared to the attitude of the United States. Um, and Cuba, uh, interestingly, has much better health care system than the United States in, <laughs> in regards to if you got sick in Cuba, you know, their coverage is actually better than the Canadian coverage and the quality of their medical people is right up to world 
top world standard, even though, you know, it's really, really a poor country because of the American sanctions just squeezing them to death. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I, I enjoyed your your Cuba comment in that regard. I, I was very impressed with the medical um, coverage and quality of care in Cuba. Yeah, Cuba sends doctors and medical professionals to other places in Latin America to help them. It actually exports its expertise. Um, so you gotta, you gotta give them credit. Anyway, uh, diabetes, big problem. And you know, there's so much in the media about people who cannot afford the insulin and um, don't have insurance and they wind up dying. They wind up dying in this country for the lack of insulin. Well, Bernie uh, Sanders has been beating the insulin drum in particular uh, because it's such a blatant one. Yeah. And, and, and uh, you know, he's dead on. I mean, he lives just, a, you know, you know, I don't know whether it's 50 miles or 100 miles from the Canadian border and, and all kinds of people in Vermont uh, cross the border and get their insulin. <laughs> you know what I, mean? I was going to ask you about that. So if I'm an American... Uh, and I want to get cheaper, much cheaper insulin. I can just uh, go across the border. I can, um, I guess, I can buy it at any number of places in Canada and come back with it, right? Yes. Oh, <laughs> now I'm not sure what American customs have. You know what? You know what they would call an illegal import or anything, but I don't think so because, uh, I mean, my knowledge of that cross-border stuff in a lot of ways was, uh, you know listening to Bernie Sanders when he's on national TV saying his neighbors are crossing the border with with the uh, insulin. I don't think he would be saying that if it was an illegal activity. <laughs> well, you know, um, you, you've been talking about how this is free and that's free. Um, but what I what I just want to confirm is that w when you when you pay your bills as a Canadian citizen or resident, when you pay your bills on the first of the month, you have to send a check to the National Health Service, or is is it zero pay, zero bills, no cost whatsoever to get the basic you know health health care that people have in Canada? And uh, Canada has ten provinces, and each province administers the health care in their province. Uh, the federal government provides a huge portion of the financing. It's much like the U.S. The federal authority has all the taxing power. The cities have the most responsibility and the least taxing power, and the provinces or the states in the U.S. case are in the middle as they don't, you know, they have lots of responsibility, but uh, they don't have enough money to pay for it. They need to get on bended knee to get the feds to help. Um, so, you know, that's really where we sit. Mm -hmm. So do you have to pay anything? Um, in some provinces, they have had a, a monthly amount you'd pay for your health care. Um, I used to live in, you know, two different provinces, which had a monthly amount. That amount, um, if your income was below a certain level, you paid less. And if your income was below a, another level, you didn't pay anything. But the amount was pretty small. It was like a hundred bucks a month. Mm -hmm. um, now that has be generally been eliminated. You know, that I don't know of any province now that, that charges a monthly fee. Of any kind. Zero. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. The other thing you mentioned that I think we ought to spend a moment dwelling on is the economics. Uh, you're you're a, a student of business and economics, um, so you can certainly appreciate that a person who is sick or worse, bankrupt because he's sick or she uh, or somebody in the family is bankrupt, um, is not going to be as productive as if he or she were well. And so when you take that on a macro level, these things we've been talking about have a huge effect, am I right? On yes. the national economy of the country involved. Can you talk about it? Yeah, I would, I would even say it's a little more than the way you described it because 
there's a difference of the the worry you know if you're just worrying about it as opposed to actually having dispersed you know you're not as productive um and i'm a i'm a great believer that um that society gets their leaders and their great producing or productive people uh from a wide swath of the population if you you just cannot rely on the sons and daughters of the really really wealthy you know most second generation uh wealthy people are spoiled kids and no good for anything you know the the kid that came from the wrong side of the tracks and the and the ghetto that scraped and finally made it to a college is probably going to be an awful lot more productive well if you look after the health of of the bottom rung of people you know their kids are going to help you a lot more than um, than if they were just left to, in squalor um you know our um uh canadian system uh, has um an unusual uh, population uh, with as uh, let's call it comes with natural health problems almost and we have uh, you know about 5% of the canadian population are the indigenous uh, people and a lot of them uh, live in very remote places i mean where there's no roads and no airports and no this and no that and and even though they're they're totally covered by the federal system the fed the feds let them down a lot you know but when we have a few of those um indigenous people living uh, let's say in in the area that i live in canada there's a um um called the okanagan valley in british columbia and there's a couple of of native tribes there where those kids have uh, or those natives have gone through a couple of generations of full health care and boy are they productive i mean do they had to society where in places where they're um so remote or or you know even the the eskimos or inuit um uh, in the far north uh, that don't have um a couple generations of decent health care um that uh, these um uh, uh natives from the okanagan are just fantastically productive and add to society uh, in great ways uh, you know they have wineries they have um you know all kinds of neat uh, businesses that they are in and do really really well at yeah well you know it's so interesting to compare that to uh, the way our federal united states federal government is working these days you know, you, you know, there's a reluctance to um, provide social safety net. There's a reluctance to, um, you know, provide anything to help poor people be less poor. Um, this thing about Roe v. Wade is very troubling um, because it means there will be children born uh, who the community doesn't care about uh, to people who don't have the money to go to another state or country for an abortion. And they're, they're going to, you know, wind up being poorer still. And if they're sick um, and they need drugs and they don't have insurance, I mean, there was a tweet this morning uh, about how the price of insulin in Canada is twelve dollars for, I guess, for a month supply or there thereabouts. In the U.S., it's hundreds and hundreds of dollars. If you don't have insurance, you have to pull money out of your wallet. Um, so the bottom line is that these people, a, uh, will be poorer um you know because of the failure of the safety net because of the failure of a universal health system because of the failure of 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 drugs uh, at reasonable prices um and as a result they will not be productive not as not as much as the in inuits um or the other indigenous people in your neck of the woods um and also be you know they will they will be a, a drag on everyone else 
It costs much more to have to get your health care at an emergency room every time, which is what happens in this country. It's always the emergency room. Um, and so what you have is a, a completely diseconomic experience. It's almost as if the people in Congress wanted to hurt the poor people. It's almost as, as if the people in the Supreme Court wanted to have unwanted babies in this country who will make it even more difficult for the poor people. And, and the net effect for the lack of universal health care, universal drug coverage is, is um, absolutely a, 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 a damaging, if not a profoundly damaging blow uh, to the economy of this country. We may not see it yet, but it is coming. Don't you agree? Oh, I agree. And while you were um, giving that thought, it made me think of uh, perhaps the best example in the world of of treating um, your entire population as being the key to your economy is is Singapore. You know, Singapore's a, a you know small place, one city. You know, it might have six million people stuffed in it, or it's you know the size of Boston or San Francisco or Philadelphia or Dallas kind of thing. But nevertheless, uh, you know, they they had no natural resources. They had nothing going for them. You know, the the political decision was the only thing we have is people. So why don't we educate them? You know, create a healthy environment. Uh, you know, and and you know, they stood on their head to move everybody along. And now, you know, part of the reason they now have six million is everybody that lived, uh, you know, with several hundred miles away would try to get to go to Singapore and see if they can join in. But it's really the second generation and third generation people that that have made it uh, to a standard of living that's it's far better than the U.S. right now. Yeah, oh, all true. They're so smart. But it's not rocket science, you know? This country could do those kinds of things. It's just that the people who are running the country just can't seem to find their way. Uh, you know, and, and one thing, you know, I've, you and I have talked about this, is uh, uh, if, if I'm really dissatisfied with the United States, if Trump is ever, or his acolytes are, uh, ever elected presidents <laughs> occupy the the Oval Office and do the kinds of things they were teasing us with, teasing themselves with in his first term. Um, you know, it's going to be much worse for the average citizen, not just the people who are disadvantaged economically or healthcare wise. Everybody is going to suffer in one way or another. Uh, and so, you know, the question is: uh, uh, suppose suppose I cross the border. Um, you know, uh, in the state of Washington, over to British Columbia, uh, and I say I present myself, and uh, I want to have the benefit of the Canadian healthcare system. Ken, I'll be there. I, I'll um, I'll bring my backpack, and I'll I'll sign any papers you want. Can I do that? Um, not the first day you arrive, but um, it's a fairly short period of time that you need to be a citizen I, I you know i'm not sure of the immigration status but for americans you know much like somebody who's from australia or or united kingdom or or new zealand uh, the you know they come to canada often and and work here and um and have all the coverage uh, some uh you know are here you know intentionally on a temporary basis but uh, but work uh, you know and they're not limited in their working like um, uh, us visas but also you know they can get citizenship well the minute you got a work permit and things the healthcare system applies mm. oh that's really good and so um um gee that, that you know, it's very appealing to be able to do that and as you mentioned earlier uh, I can always get kind of a supplemental policy to cover me uh, for the gaps while I'm waiting. Am I right? Um, oh, you can always get service. That is, you know, if you're if you're in the U.S. and you you know pay for the service there, if you cross the border, the cost to pay for the same service will be less. You know, like you you know, but. Um, you know, you have difficulty 
um, paying, like like some of the um, the provinces are really um, careful to not allow physicians for to do extra billing. You know, so extra billing kind of highlights, you know, one of the problems with universal health care is that the the rich guy gets annoyed that he wants a hip replacement and he wants to go to the front of the line. You know, and he, he can lay down a lot of money. And so, um, you know, why can't he just go to, you know, the uh, the orthopedic surgeon and and say, put me to the front of the line and I'll pay more, you know, and, and if the surgeon had the legal authority to do so, he probably would. Um, uh, well in Canada, that's not legal. You can't jump the queue. Uh, you know, the, the universal coverage, it's kind of like for a medical necessary, a medically necessary procedure or service based on need not ability to pay. So the guy with the most need goes first. That's fair. That's it, totally it, equitable. It's, it's fair and reasonable, but... but there are people but who you, want to jump the you, line okay. anyway. <laughs> but then you have the idea of, uh, let, let's get down to constitutional rights and say, uh, pretend I'm the rich guy, you know, which unfortunately I'm not. But uh, anyhow, that... Um, <clears throat> Um, I want to um, have my hip replacement and uh, and it's really annoying me and I'm hobbling and and so that I could give a constitutional argument that that uh, my uh, right to life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness or whatever the phrases are in the in the Constitution. Uh, you know that's suffering badly, and and that uh, you know this healthcare system is preventing me from paying money to get it fixed, and that's un unconstitutional. You're depriving me of a right. Um, well, those cases they've actually had some of those cases in Canada, and they've booted them out. <laughs> uh, you know that is they they've kind of said, um, uh, you know, yes. You know, Mr. Rich Guy, you're you're suffering. That is unreasonable, but it does not go. It doesn't pass the uh, public goods or what's in the public good test. That is, if you do that, it damages the system, and the system doesn't work. And so, goodbye. That's a wonderful result, Ken. That's so reasonable and rational and equitable. In any event, um, you know, we're out of time and uh, I just want to thank you for this discussion. It's, it's helpful and it's helpful to understand where the U.S. is and where it isn't. And, uh, and, and we have to knock our heads now wondering why it isn't and why this country can't seem to take care of its citizens and doesn't want to. It doesn't want to give them options. Even the uh, Obama Affordable Care Act is so constrained and limited. Uh, that we have to work so hard against so many lobbyists um, to achieve public health in this country. It's not a good sign. And if I don't go to Canada, I'll, I'll take a look at the UK. Maybe, maybe you can look with me. We'll <laughs> about, check out Europe. Anyway, thank you, Ken. It's great to talk to you. We'll, yeah, we'll one, la in. one last bit um, yeah. is, is uh, politically, it seems really stupid to be against health care because if you take people in Canada, there is nothing as sacred politically as the health care system. The push is to have more, better coverage, not less. And there is nobody like medical doctors, like they're really rare, rare occasions where you got people that are that would politically vote for any reduction in anything to do with the health care. So I can't see why you know, people don't really push it for American political gain. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great, uh, it's a great uh, uh, platform point for anybody running for office, as it has been, but it doesn't seem to get over the, the Rubicon that well. Anyway, we'll see what happens with uh, 
you know, the implementation of the changes uh, in in the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. It remains to be seen how effective that will be. Uh, and and uh, it remains to be seen what we're going to talk about two weeks from now. Maybe we should talk about retirement systems uh, in the U.S. versus Canada. There's a lot. There's a lot there too. Uh, Ken Rogers. Uh, well, you part... keep picking on on where the U.S. has no safety net, and we got lots. <laughs> okay, that's the subject. <laughs> two weeks from now, with yeah. the comparative retirement systems between Canada and the U.S. with Dr. Ken Rogers. Thank you so much, Ken. Bye for now. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.